All right. Well, our first item of business is a uh, public hearing for Sovereign Builders um, request for an amended order of conditions and a new notice of intent related to utilities and the road stream crossing. Um, and with that, I will hand it off to you, Chris and Todd, uh, to, to give us the update. Um, can you enable me for a screen share? Yeah. Good evening. My name is Chris Carney. I'm here tonight on behalf of Todd Fuller of Sovereign Builders, of the project off state road. The previously approved self storage project inside of a road across from the town top of. So, just to remind everyone of the original project, uh, the self storage project, uh, which would be state road over on the west side. The driveway was approved for the three buildings, stormwater features shown. Uh, but tonight we're here to discuss uh, an amendment to the previous uh, order of conditions issued for the site, and also uh, later on a notice of intent for the same site. They work in unison with each other related to the same uh, issue, which has to do with the water line that was approved. Uh, hope you can see my cursor in the bottom left corner of the plan. Uh, the water line was approved to go through the wetland, under the wetland, using a directional boring. Uh, so Chris, can you? No can you zoom in on that area of interest? Because the rest of the site's really not that important to us. Yep. So this was the original uh, plan, showing the water line with a directional boring staging area here, and then another directional boring staging area over uh, here and here. Uh, and that was to uh, limit work in the wetlands. Uh, so the directional boring was just bore underneath the wetland come out on the other side of the water line, which is a great idea and theory. But uh, after some conversations with the DPW and I think with some uh, commission members, uh, the way directional boring works is there's a plastic sleeve to the water pipe. And uh, I think there was a wish to not have any plastic underneath the wetland, which is an understandable request. Uh, so ductile iron was the, uh, the requirement from uh, DPW. And directional boring methods don't really allow uh, for that type of material to be placed without there being possibilities for freezing. I guess the, the alternative would have the plastic pipe would be some sort of metal sleeve pipe that the stuff of iron water uh, pipes would be inside of. And I guess due to that uh, configuration, freezing is sometimes an issue. Uh, so, because of those issues, we're going to propose tonight a new route. The water line. And that's shown on this uh, new, new plan that was submitted. Hopefully, everyone has a chance to review it. Uh, looking at the same area here. You can see the original water line here. State road, it's grayed out. And you can see a new proposed water line, state road. It's following parallel to the crossing in northerly of the proposed and previously approved retain wall. It's as close to the retain wall as there can be uh, to functionally trench. Uh, and so this area here represents the new work. And this area here would be uh, the first item that would be the removal of certain areas of work from the original order of condition. So up here on the northwest side where the boring uh, was being staged, this will be removed and this uh, area of alteration will be eliminated. And then down here in the uh, lower right, this area uh, would also be removed. Looking at the plan, those are the description of the different requirements for both the amendment and the new NLI. Uh, and so the amendment will include that uh, removal of those areas of alteration uh, details for the structural requirements of the crossing, which were included in the application so long uh, 
report, structural report done by context out in Chicopee. And then at, uh, adding a deep watering plan to allow for construction through this area. So those three items are in uh, amendment request. There's detail further in, in these areas here. Um, on sheet two, deep watering uh, details are shown here, as well as some um, uh, notes for deep water. Something I need to definition with reading all these notes, but I will. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and uh, I'd be happy to address any questions you have about this request for an amendment. So, um, this is a little confusing for me because, um, you know, the amended, amended order of conditions. Um, is it related to the water? Water. Yeah. But the uh, but the notice of intent is also for the water. Correct. And so, um, I think the reason for a new notice of intent is the area of alteration ultimately will be changed and expanded. So that's the requirement for the notice of intent. Anytime there's a new area of alteration, really the proper course of action is the notice of intent. Uh, and then. Um, as part of that, there's areas of the original order conditions, which was a result of the original notice of intent filed in the project, uh, that some of those areas are no longer needed, and some areas of the original order conditions can be uh, specified as the structural requirements of the process. Uh, so those two items get attached to the original order of conditions. That way, the original area of alteration can be reduced through this amendment. Since it's not a larger or significantly changed uh, impact, this amendment uh, can be applied to the original order of conditions. So, but the plans that's that's the plans that are in the NOI for the crossing structure and the channel construction really doesn't pertain to the notice of intent. It's really would probably be better included with the request for the amendment. Correct. Yep. All right. So, um, no changes to the crossing are proposed at all. Really, the only changes that are proposed are the rerouting of the water line. Yeah, I mean, except there's more detail about the crossing. Correct. And if I remember right, I think Mickey's request, uh, Mickey said it would be bigger than it was originally proposed because he thought the bank pool width had been underestimated. So I'm wondering if the structure itself isn't a different size than the original NOI. I, I don't think the footprint of the structure group is different. Actually, the structure is wider. So it was originally 10 foot and it's now 11 foot six in terms of it's spanning the <clears throat> so right. originally drawn was 10 foot, but the actual is 11 foot six. Not not width wise, but the but the right. span on the right on the stream. Right. Um, so that should be better, I would assume, because we're. Right, right. And that's what I meant, you know, that, that, that Mickey said that the bank for width was actually wider than originally estimated, and therefore he, he wanted to create a longer span uh, so that you could get 1.2 bankful width. Um, so, all right, so I guess what I, my suggestion is, is these are all mixed up in my mind, these two filings, and that we just handle them together as an aggregate. And essentially there are two things that are, that we should probably focus on tonight. The first one is the water line and the details of how that's gonna be constructed and then the second is the uh, the additional detail about the crossing itself and how the stream channel uh, plans and construction, uh, including uh, dewatering uh, that would be necessary if the work is not done when when it's dry. Um, does that sound reasonable to to all of you? Yeah, it sounds reasonable. Yes, but I I will want to be walked through it. 
Right. In more detail. Right. So let's start with the water line. So um, you can't you can't jack it underneath the wetland. Um, in some cases, I've seen water lines that run along uh, stream crossings that are above ground rather than going trenching through the stream and the wetland. They just run as an attachment through. Is that something that was considered in this case? I don't think we no, we didn't consider it. But I mean, the main reason was for the you know, for the concern of freezing, and how, and how do you how do you avoid that in New England? I mean, it's very rare that you see it in New England. I mean, you you need it's that's typical in a, in New England in a scenario where it's going to run on a regular basis where the water is going to flow and you and you're but this is st basically stagnant water. It's it's sitting. It's a it's a fire sprinkler system in a building that has a bathroom and a you know a toilet and a sink that's mm -hmm. going to run very sporadically mm -hmm. yeah I, I assume that that was probably the case i just wanted to ask the question uh so you're going to be trenching through the stream and how far below the stream bed is this pipe going to go approximately four and a half feet it, that would be the you know the the uh desired but it's yeah the desired depth is four and a half feet of cover. And and you're going to do that in a, with, after this while the stream is being dewatered and the crossing is being inserted all at one at the same time. Correct. So sandbags would be placed. We, you know, we've 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 installed temporary electric electric on site. So dewatering can be 24 seven without noise to the neighbors or affecting the area, you know, from a, from a sound perspective, but yes, yeah, sandbag it and dig the, to excavate for the water line and the footings for the culvert all in, in you know, one, in, at one time frame, and then close it, you know, repair the stream bottom and, and open it all back up again. And, um, is the detail about like the depth to which the pipe is going, is that on the plans? I can't remember seeing it. No. So a previously approved plan shows the water line up to four foot depth. That's the question. Okay. Um, Commissioners, that you have questions or comments about the water? I can't think of anything at the moment. Yeah, no, Chris, I your audio was was breaking up some, and it was a little little difficult to follow one piece of it. Where did the objection to the uh, to the directional boring come from? It was so a the combination of specifications from the DPW. Waitley DPW? Yes, the Waitley DPW. The materials they requested or, or require underneath. At the water department? It, it is the water, it was the water department. And, and the issue is that they would pipe jack with a plastic pipe. And then there's airspace around. So a larger plastic pipe would be installed because apparently they can't they can't directional bore with duct wire it's just too rigid in that it's it's not going to move around any any obstacles apparently and or it may break and shatter so a larger diameter plastic pipe would be used and then there's an airspace around it that can be subject to you know that causes the duct line or can cause the duct line to freeze so that, that they don't really <clears throat> They don't like that method. They'd rather have duct hole buried in earth so that it has frost protection in that way. And the same, you know, they'd say the same with a root 10. They want ductile under root 10. Most of Waitley is not ductile, but in this case, they're requiring ductile iron under root, under, you know, root 10 and under the stream. <clears throat> Any follow up, George? Not yet. Somebody else want to jump in while I think about this? <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't have anything right now. No, I don't have questions either. I just my just thinking one. Uh, so I seen on the plan that says the alteration was increased by I think two about two hundred fifty feet. Is that going to increase the restoration that you're going to have to do as well? Uh, yeah, there is a new restoration area. Okay. It is on top of and expanding the area that is. All right, well, and let's shift our focus to the stream crossing. Um, and actually, I, I made a list of questions. Some of it has to do specifically with the crossing and some of it more general. But since you were just talking about the wetland replication or wetland replacement uh, mitigation issues, um, I noted that on the plans, it says that uh, wetland replication will be done during the growing season and that it will also be done at the same time that the crossing is installed. And so I just want to make sure that that's what your intention truly is, because that means you will not be able to install the crossing until the growing season. That's definitely not my intent. My intent and, and purpose of, of you know coming before you tonight is so that we can do this crossing without waiting for weather that's very unpredictable. So I, I'm not sure, Chris, I, I guess you'll have to answer it. It was not my intention to wait until spring or summer of next year to, to do this work. Uh, Scott, is that no on the previous, previously approved plans or is that on <laughs> it's on both. It's on the previous ones, it's on the current ones. Well, then I guess the expense should be revised to have weather replication during immediately uh, allowed growing season. Yes, the stream so, crossing should go. Go ahead. The stream crossing would go in in the winter and then weather replication again in the spring. Yeah, so um, I have two concerns about that. Um, one is if you're doing a winter install installation, how are you going to stabilize the site since you're not going to be able to seed and plant uh, and expect any vegetation to become established for, for several months? And the other question is, um, it is generally good practice to do the replication work at the same time that you're doing the installation work because the record in Massachusetts is, is that many replication sites never get built and what happens is, is that once they completed their project, they just say, I'm not going to do it. And it's really hard for conservation commissions to enforce the order of conditions and ensure that those replication areas get built. So my second question is, what kind of assurances can you provide that you're actually going to follow through and come back during the growing season in order to do those two replication areas? So I'm happy to so, you know, I'm happy to answer that. The, the, the reality of, of this project is we won't be complete until well, you know, long after probably fall of next year, 2023, fall of this year. So, uh, you know, attach some sort of condition that we that we wouldn't receive our certificate of occupancy prior to sort of uh, to, to you all viewing and accepting the replication. Which would be fine with me because I, I'm intent. You know, the intent is to follow through. So you're going to be doing building on the site until the fall, you say, or is that? So 30, 30 thousand square foot structure. So yeah, that by the time it, it's you know climate controlled, by the time it's completed, it it'll be fall. When is that construction going to begin? So that that's you know we've started out there. We've we've started. We haven't excavated for foundations yet but um the building has a has a pretty substantial lead time the buildings won't be delivered until I, I think it's may um so the so the actual physical building construction won't start until then something like that there, it's you know quite a process yeah all right so how about this for an idea then if we were to put a schedule a replication schedule <laughs> where the replication work would be completed by a, cert, a date certain. 
and that um, you know that would be a condition in the order of conditions that the replication work would be completed by such and such a date agreed on you know between the commission and you that would at least give us the leverage that if the work isn't done by that date and there is and we have any concern about whether it will be done we can issue a cease and desist on all work on the property until that uh, comes into compliance it's it's fine with me and you know because we really intend to do the work so if we put a reasonable date on it um everybody should be you know it's a it's a middle ground we tend to do the work and you have some some means of of affecting our progress if we don't okay and and i don't i don't want you to take this personally todd it, it has to do with our experience with other no, people. I, th I think you said it before and I, and I heard you and I, and I, and I can see how, how it would, would happen that, you know, yeah. the work gets done and, and contractors, you have no teeth in it and he doesn't care anymore. And, you know, and then it, it vegetates itself. It's, you know, and, and that's it. I get, I get it. I do. That's not really. Yeah. I mean, of course, everybody who get into enters into these things is well intended let's let's go beyond the well intention and and actually do it and i'm all for it okay good yeah so that'll be something that you'll need to change on the plan uh <clears throat> because generally whatever you submit with the notice of intent is binding on you and we don't have to put it in the order of conditions if it's actually in your plan so if you want to change that just submit uh revised plans uh, that will be the plans of record that we will reference in the order of conditions. What date is reasonable? What, what date should we put a date in the plan as well? Uh, the, in terms of when to complete the the replication work, right? The drop dead date it needs to be done by. I would say, why don't you suggest a date? So let's and, let's and we will put that in the order itself so that it's clear and it's it's obvious, uh, but. You know, it's when you reasonably think you can get it done. We we want to just make sure it gets done, right? And if you can tell us we can get it done by the end of June, then we can put that. If you say, well, better off making it end of July, you know, we can probably live with that, as long as you're still going to be on the site by the time you know this is done, and we still have some leverage. Right, we will still be on the site. I I would I would almost yeah. I would even say September because we just don't know if we have a dry season like last year and but I, I don't know. So the stream was dry all last year. And so I can picture us having a similar summer where we're running out there to water things on a, on a daily basis to make sure it, you know, if, if it is as dry as last year, um, then it might end up that it ends towards the fall before we can have success in growing. So who knows? Okay. So I would say um, put it in your revised plans what your what your target is for for that being completed. I mean it's it's really not completed for a couple of years after because you really need to see the vegetation get established. You need to replace plantings that have died in the meantime. So we don't expect it to be 100% revegetated and ready to go, but it should be at least excavated to grade. There should be a way to demonstrate appropriate hydrology appropriate soils and that there's been some initial planting or seeding done uh, that we will then monitor to see that it that it comes through over a period of a couple of years. And sure. And so the but your ability so but I, I we're not talking about a couple of years. Um, a couple for, of years uh, would be the maybe a monitoring requirement on the order of condition on that would then before you could get a certificate of compliance, you would have to demonstrate that after two sure. years, you had established uh -huh. it. It would not be the deadline by which we would then hold up any additional mm -hmm. work. The main thing is it's gotta be constructed. You know, once it's constructed, right. once it's constructed with a, an environmental monitor who, you know, basically says, yes, the elevations are correct. Yes, the soil is correct. It has been planted as proposed, um, then, you know, we become less concerned that the, because the rest is sort of tweaking and maintenance. And, you know, for that, we have the certificate of compliance we can hold to try to make sure that right. that, that additional remedial work gets done. 
So there's a there's a there's a there's a real incentive to wrap up all of the environmental related topics on these sites, and that is the new SWIP reporting requirements, which cost money every time there's a storm event. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when when we can establish the areas, wetland and so on that are within the bounds of the silt fence, yeah, and complete that work the billing cycle uh, and the cost of the SWIP reporting will go away. Right. And so there's a, there's a new financial incentive for us contractors to wrap it up. Okay. Um, a couple other questions. So um, the things that I didn't see on the plans that I would like to see on the plans is, you know, where is your dewatering sump located? Uh, you described, you know, creating a sump for dewatering, but I don't know where you're planning to put it. Same thing with the sediment bag and, and the hay bale corral around it. You know, where are you going to locate that so that we have a sense that that what you're proposing is practical and you're not just going to wing it when you're on the site. Um, and then related to that is, is, you know, you talk about keeping clean water separate from the dirty water and routing the clean water directly into the stream below, which is fine. Uh, but then also you're gonna be taking any turbid water and pumping it to the sediment bag. And so uh, I'm just interested to know what's the, what's the, um, you know, what's the return path for water getting back in the stream? You know, so it should be really clear on the plan that here's the sump, it pumps to the bag over here. It then is going to be going through a hose or a pipe and entering back over here when it's clean, uh, or is it going to just go uh, through the the bag, through the hay bale corral, and then just overland flow or infiltration? And there's really not going to be a return pipe or or a hose. In which case, the location of that bag is going to be important because you want to have enough of a filter strip for that water to be able to spread out and seep in, so you're not going to get, uh, you know any any problems as it flows back towards the wetland black toward back towards the stream so all i'm asking for is a little more detail on the plan about how and where that's all going to be located okay i don't i don't doubt that it can be done i just want to know what it is <clears throat> that you've thought it through and you know what's going to go where so to be honest i, I i'm working with a group of I'm going to do this work with a group that uh, worked up, you know, that some retired guys from Northern construction and their, their background is, is bridge construction. And so I, I don't personally know the, the details to the extent that they would, but we can, we can gather them and put them on the plan. Okay. But the, you it, know, could the, all, it could all be changed if something gets encountered, you know, as long as there's agreement <laughs> And the conservation commission is contacted and we talk to the environmental monitor and we say yeah this is a better plan put it over there we know that sometimes during the course of construction you come up with things that are unexpected or you need to make adjustments but it's just useful to know that you have a more concrete idea of how it's going to go before you even get started and then if it needs to be adjusted later we can think we can talk about doing that okay sure the goal is to be in and out of there in about a week something like that but um and so so there will be you know there may be some decisions made and adjustments made on the fly a little bit just to just to, just to keep it moving yeah um and then uh, the the last question that i had looking at this stuff was um the cross sections for the stream the proposed stream channel so I see cross sections A, B, C, and D. And then when I uh, look at the actual cross sections and the elevations, what it looks like to me is that the stream bottom at cross section A, which is up gradient of the crossing, uh, the bottom of that is uh, 62, uh, 162. Uh, and then the cross sections at the inlet and outlet of the crossing are at elevations 163, and then at D, it goes back down to 162. So it it seems like the elevations of the crossing are too high. They're not consistent or not 
compatible with the elevations of the stream channel itself at the Thalwag. Am I reading that wrong? Chris, do you want to address yeah, that? Yeah, I'm looking at the time right now. I, yeah, I me, think I'm, I'm seeing the me, cell wave at the beginning of the entrance and exit existing, uh, shown at 162. And yeah, I, I see that within the crossing, it is 163 proposed. So yeah, a foot difference between the existing grade and the uh, that. Yeah, uh, here, let me share my screen just so everybody knows what I'm talking about. I think the the, the also we we had agreed. I mean, it's it's calling out riprap where it's supposed to be three to six inch rounded stone. So I think. Yeah. Right. So, so this is um, just to illustrate where we were. So this being the crossing, uh, this is cross section B to B, C to C, and D to D. A is up here in the stream channel above. And then uh, when we look at the actual cross sections proposed, uh, you know, so this is a, this is where you're going to be doing some work along the side for the for the water pipe, is it, or is this un, going to be untouched? That would be the water pipe. Yeah. All right. So that's where you're going to put. Um, so this is going to be stone here. Okay. It, it's as necessary, depending on the width of the tank. Mm -hmm. I'm showing it at full width. Yeah, because I know that. The, the cross section at the entrance of the pipe uh, of the culvert, you're going to have um, about 16 inches, uh, well, eight, what is it, eight inches of stone in here from minus four to minus 12. This yeah. is angular riprap, but that should say rounded stone according to Mickey's proposal. And then on top of that, there's going to be about four inches of, of sands and silt from as much as possible from what's been excavated, correct? So the idea is uh, for, the, for the commissioners, um, in my communications with Mickey Marcus about how to construct this channel, initially his proposal was just to leave this all flat and let the stream cut its way through. Uh, my concern with that is, is that this is very wide, and if the stream um, actually during storms gets funneled through there and no longer has access to its floodplain, it could actually clear a lot of this out, and then it would just be a big, wide, shallow uh, area where the water flows, which is not going to provide the kind of fish passage that we we're hoping for. So instead, use the stone to create a shape for a low, low flow channel. And then you can put other sediment on top, but if it should all get swept away in a flood, it doesn't even have to be a very big one. It could all get washed away and isn't replenished from upstream. You still have a channel and you still have a channel shape with a low flow channel to concentrate your low flow and make sure there's sufficient depth for fish to be able to swim back and forth through there. So that's the basic design as illustrated here, but once you put in the stone and then you put in this, now you're up to uh, 163. So even right. though the bottom of the stone is at 162, uh, where the water is supposed to flow is, is higher than it is upstream. Yes, and, and I think I'll still stand by those elevations at 163 in order to match the existing culvert elevation. Uh, we have the in and the out of the culvert existing at 163.1 and 163.2. So this is an attempt to match those existing elevations in order to have the same sort of uh, water back up behind the crop. Yeah. Um a lot of times those uh, crossings should be at a lower elevation. Those those relictual crossings, they're, they're too high and they don't account for bed adjustment. So having this a little bit lower, I think is probably not a bad idea. 
So I get down at 162 and continuous elevation through there. You say 162? Yeah, we, it, yeah correct. 162 matching. Yeah, it would, it would match upstream and downstream. So that seems like probably a good way to go. I mean, I don't think there's going to be a lot of down cutting. Because it's a very, very low gradient system in there. But if this were a high, excuse me, Sorry. what? Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, if this were a higher gradient system, we would want the to go the the bottom to be lower and then more sort of material on top, so that you know if you end up with uh, bed adjustments. So often over a period of decades, you can get the stream bed will drop a certain amount or it might raise amount depending on where there's woody debris or whether beavers move in. Any number of things can cause either scour or aggradation of sediment and change the the bed elevation. I don't expect a lot of that here, but I think at least matching the elevations above and below probably makes sense. Yeah, I think there'll be a little bit less upstream ponding, which would affect that existing uh, wetland area and the wetland replication area. But I don't think anything I can overcome. Okay. That's just the wish of the commission. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if it's going to, it's going to be constrained by the downstream channel as well. So if it's a little too deep, it's just going to back water up and then more sediment is going to deposit in there. So it's, it's going to adjust its elevation you know, based on that, as long as it's not too high. If it's if it's low, it can adjust, but if it's too high, it'll just backwater up upstream and eventually potentially, you know, block some of that flow downstream. I mean, we're talking about a foot, a foot's more than a couple of inches. So I think that's probably a good correction to make. Um, so anyway, those are my questions. Uh, I open it up to the other commissioners. If you have questions, feel free to, to fire away. Uh, nothing for me, thanks. You covered everything, Scott? <laughs> so, Anything at all about, in terms of comments or questions about what we've talked about this evening, the proposal for the water pipe and for the, the crossing itself, uh, feel free to speak up now. All right. Um, the the DEP has not yet issued a file number for this project. Uh, my understanding, that's still right, Chris? Yes, yeah, correct. So we're not supposed to close the public hearing until we've gotten a file number and comments from DEP. Because DEP often makes comments that, that should be addressed by the applicant at a public hearing. So I don't know that we have any choice except to uh, continue the hearing until our next meeting but I can't do that without permission of the applicant. So um, Todd, if, if you're willing, I'd like to po I'd like to continue the hearing until February 15th, which is our next meeting. That's fine. I expected, Chris and I spoke and I knew that this would you know, need to be extended. So it's fine with me. All right. Um, Chris and uh, Todd, you, anything more you'd like to say to us before we... Uh, I'll, I'll have those revisions to the plan made as best as soon as possible. The revisions to the plan, uh, and just procedurally, it, it seems like both the amendment and the NOI have been lumped into one meeting uh, at, at this point. Um, it, it may be good to open and close the NOI. At, I'm, I'm sorry, you, your audio is not great, so it's hard to to catch it. What you're oh, saying? Um, it may be a wise idea to open the NOI and then. The NOI as well, like both items that were on here. Yeah, I mean, I'm considering they're both open. The request for the and the in the NOI public. I'm, I'm making it one public hearing for both uh, submittals. So, yes, it's open now. We'll continue them both uh, until February, and then hopefully we'll have everything we need, and we'll be able to close the hearing then. I really appreciate your time and your thorough work. It's a very nice project. All right. Um, so, 
commissioners, uh, the proposal before us is to continue the public hearing until uh, February 15th at 7 p.m. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. It's unanimous and uh, therefore the, the hearing is continued and we'll see you next month. Uh, if I forget to send you the agenda with the Zoom information, just remind me, but actually we have the same Zoom meeting every month. So what, what you use this time will be the one you use next time as well. Very good. Thank Sounds you. good. Thank you all for your time tonight. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Um, the next order of business is the uh, minutes. So did anybody find fault with, with the minutes? Minutes were good. Yep. good. <laughs> all right, all in favor of accepting the minutes? Aye. Aye. All right, good. Um, I'm trying to remember all the other things I was supposed to sort of update you on based on uh, uh, so one update has to do with the um, the feasibility study from FERCOG on uh, a shared conservation agent. So they did um, release the feasibility study. I just got it. I sent it out to you all. I think you all got it as well. Mm -hmm. yep. So almost none of the suggested changes that I made actually got incorporated into the final report, but that's no matter. Um, so there's the option is still before us to uh, to try to buy into some kind of a shared agent. They have a couple of models for how to do that. One would be to create an office in Greenfield that FERCOG would host. That would be sort of like the building inspector. Um, <laughs> George doesn't think that's a very good option. <laughs> I'm afraid it'd be too much like the building inspector. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much dissatisfaction with that that model and how it's worked um, from, from citizens and from other boards and down in the town offices. Yeah. yeah. So the other would be that towns get together and they and they create a uh, an intermunicipal municipal agreement or whatever they call and one town would have to really serve as sort of the lead on that and provide desk space, a computer, uh, a telephone, et cetera. So I'm not sure, you know, how there were nine towns apparently that were part of this study. And I don't know, I, I actually asked uh, uh, Keith, the barnacle, the guy who put the feasibility study together, I asked him, I said, so what, what's your sense? I mean, how many towns are actually gonna follow through and actually wanna do this? And his response was he thought that there was a lot of interest in it amongst all of the towns and that, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite likely that there will be towns that want to go forward with this. Um, one is, of the, it lot, is it like neighboring towns or are they pretty scattered apart from each other? Uh, well, it, I think Conway and Ashfield are, mm -hmm. I think, two of the towns and then Heath. So I think, you know, west of the river, I think those are the key ones and then there's i think wendell uh leverett um, irving 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 yeah um so and what i think what he's sort of seeing is maybe there's two positions one for east of the river and one for west of the river and the one thing is you know conway ashfield and heath are not that dissimilar from waitley in terms of size and i imagine the need yeah, so, um, yeah general same idea of what they plans or stuff that comes to the towns yeah i get that and you know maybe style of operating too you know whereas if you get a town like leverett that already has a part-time administrator <laughs> you know they might expect something very different you know i i have a feeling that the four towns that that i just mentioned are all just trying to get the wetlands act stuff done and there's not going to be a lot of additional work beyond that that mm -hmm. we're going to hope to get help with um but one of the other things that came through uh, that I also sent you was this district local technical assistance project requests. Um, last year, we went through this list and we made our recommendations to Brian. And one of them was this feasibility study and it actually happened. Uh, and this shared 
agent is on the list again this year as a possible project, uh, which could then provide them with the funding for an implementation phase where if we wanna come up with this intermunicipal agreement and, and, and have meetings with other towns, that FERCOG could help facilitate that process and help shepherd us through what we need to do in order to make it a reality. Uh, so, you know, it does seem like it's a real live possibility. Um, I'm, I, uh, I still need to put, put in our budget for next year, and I'll probably do that this weekend. And I'll, I'll put in a placeholder for the amount of money. It may not happen next fiscal year. It may be the next one after that. But um, hopefully, the uh, finance committee and the select board will support us on that. Uh, so, you all still on board? And think it's a good idea? Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yes. And do the rest of you agree with George's assessment that we don't want it based in Greenfield if, if possible? Yes. yes. I'll trust George's judgment. <laughs> <laughs> well, the well, the model was to establish an office in Greenfield at the FR Cog offices and uh, have the person operate out of there, with uh, potential added expense when uh, whenever they have to travel to the towns. And. Um, We'd, we'd be one small part of that. And what we've seen with the building inspection program, at least from much of what I've heard, uh, we don't we just don't get the attention here. Mm -hmm. And then things here that um, should get more attention from the building inspector don't necessarily uh, get it in, in a timely way. And uh, there have been lots of complaints from mm -hmm. citizens and uh, and other boards, I know. The ZBA, the planning board, the board of health, um, there are lots of ongoing concerns in town around um, white birch, um, which has just come up again. Um, the uh, explosives uh, location there on, on Chestnut Plain, um, things like that. But, uh, the building inspector has, is notified repeatedly, but um, there's not a lot of uh, closing of the loops, I guess I'll say. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think if, if, if we had a shared conservation agent who was in town, a designated number of hours in a space per week, and then had more more of a at least a part time location here. That we'd have um, probably more engagement and then commitment to to this part of that job. Scott, it did seem looking at the materials that um, the part timer in Leverett is also a part timer in Wendell. It's. Uh, I got that Wendell and Leverett had part-time agent, but I didn't know if it's the same person. Seemed like it was from from something I read in there, and okay. I didn't know if that was a shared arrangement or if it was someone with two part-time jobs. Yeah, that I don't know. You may you may have caught something that I didn't didn't see. I'm just wondering yeah. if they have a model that's already uh, been tested. About Conflict of interest. It was the same job in two different towns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would I mean, that be a conflict of interest? Well, he's getting, I'm trying to think, because how is it built? Because you're getting paid the same rate for the same job or something. I'm trying to well, maybe it's not. I don't know. Maybe, it, yeah, it just could be. Well, if, if it's if it's 10 hours in each town. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. All I think right. it was in, in, the, in the survey results. I think I saw, saw that mentioned. Yeah. Mention, but, uh, yeah. I mean, for me, I think it would make sense for the four towns west of the river that we mentioned, mm -hmm. because none of us are going to have so much work that we're going to be able to keep somebody busy. Yeah. I mean, if we did a quarter of a position that that's 10 hours a week, what are we going to have them do 10 hours a week? You know, that's not <laughs> that's not what we need necessarily. We're more like 10 hours a month. Um, so, you know, we'll need to. Uh, you know, try to pool ourselves together and, and and figure out what the needs are of the other towns as well. Maybe that's too, maybe the four of us can't come up with enough hours to keep somebody busy uh, full time. How, how many old files are there, Scott? <laughs> yeah, I mean that could keep somebody busy for probably several months. It's uh, when I looked at the files, it was just like daunting. You know, it's just. Yeah. Uh, 
but it's always some, something I always wanted to try to get done. So maybe that is something we can get done if we had some help, some paid help. Yeah, it'd be great to have them all digitized. Oh, now you're dreaming big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's so many different things that if I had more time, I would organize things better, you know, like just having a spreadsheet where you can keep track of things. So like when you say there has to be a pre-construction meeting and there are all these other different requirements, like when you when you issue an order of conditions, they're supposed to record it at the registry of deeds. And then they're also supposed to request a certificate of compliance when they're done. And so many projects never go through that. You know, they, they just never request the certificate. And then, you know, like we had one situation, I think some, when a property was being sold, you know, there was an old order of conditions from 1984 or something like that. And they needed mm -hmm. a certificate of compliance. And we're like, I don't even know where that file is, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> how are we supposed to do that? So it would be nice if we could track that, you know, and, and when they're supposed to reimburse the town for the cost of a public notice, you know, I never know whether they've done it or not, you know, so you know, the checks come in, sometimes I get asked about them, I say, oh yeah, that's a reimbursement, but I don't know who hasn't sent in the check. And, you know, are we, you know, so we're, we're not really very efficient or thorough. So are you saying that if we had somebody in that position, they would make the spreadsheet or track those things or both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yep. Make it and track it, you know, set up a system mm -hmm. and then track it for us. And, you know, like, like George said, then we would have all of the file numbers in in a database or in an, a spreadsheet. Yeah, that sounds useful. And you know, we could search by address, or we could search by file number, or we could search by date when we're trying mm -hmm. to find stuff or applicant. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think that would sort of help us um, get ourselves organized, but also the more more professional we are the less likely we're going to get sued for something down the road if we you know didn't do something appropriately but it, it also creates a formal kind of institutional memory for the conservation commission yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and my, my you know if we can hire somebody good and keep them you know the technical expertise and also the experience and and knowledge of the regulations and of the procedures and the forms then that can that can stay there even when there's turnover on the commission so mm -hmm. you're not we're going to be reliant on me or anyone else mm -hmm. uh to try to remember all of the crazy stuff that's in the regulations or the the various different ways that different mechanisms that people might file with us or require a decision from us it's uh and i guess i gather from the uh from reading the feasibility report that the people who answered the survey in most of the towns which i presume would be the chair um they're like average less than two years in their position mm -hmm. <laughs> on the commission so that, mm -hmm. you know it's crazy that in small towns with no staff that you also have such high turnover. Yeah. Uh, institutional memory is just, in, it just isn't there. Yeah. So you're right, George, that is a, a huge benefit that we could get from this. So the, the, the last thing is just this uh, local technical assistance request form. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we wanna go through this now as part of the meeting and, and and i can send the feedback to brian or whether you'd like to just review it yourself and send me any suggestions of things that you like and that we should promote uh, how do you want to handle this i'm just going to open it up and see how long it is it's seven pages most of which doesn't don't concern us at all <laughs> let's just get it done now then yeah, yep. done. we've done that before okay here i'll share my screen and we'll go through it section by section. All right, so the first section is climate change, <laughs> adaptation and resilience. There's, I mean, can you read this or should I? Yeah, oh, we can, I can read that. Yeah. yeah, it's good. 
All right, yeah. I won't read it out loud. Uh, you can say if anything here catches your fancy or not. Well, I like the managing flood risks and the pollinator habitat corridor. Yeah, I wonder if the flood risks actually pertain to Waitley because it says that Deerfield River watershed and oh, okay, most of Waitley is in the main stem Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yes to the pollinators. Yeah, it's a yes to the pollinators. I agree with that. <laughs> and all right, so that way we I'm... tie into all the work that's being done in other towns. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we don't have a lot of brownfields. So I guess just the old De Mayo's restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not sure any of these things really pertain to us, do they? Not to the con con, no. Uh, so. All right. So regional and municipal and regional capacity building. Scott, do you have any thoughts on the last one? Yeah, I have a question on that too. Well, I certainly like the idea of advocacy for pilot formulas, but yeah. that's probably the only thing on the list that really appeals to me. You know, pilot is a payment in lieu of taxes. So towns that have a lot of conservation land and don't get property taxes from it, uh, this would be a program to make payments to those towns to make up for the cat taxes that they don't get. And uh, the pilot formulas have been generally underfunded, and uh, it's been an ongoing issue with Western Mass. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure we're going to get anywhere with it, but it's nice to know they're still shooting for it. Um, <clears throat> I'm aware of another proposal that that somebody's working on to try to get money to towns, but not through the pilot program because they feel like it's never going to happen through pilot. So we can put that on the list. I can say pilot in particular is what we're interested in. Yeah, okay. I say pilot. So pollinators and pilots, we're all in P's now so mm -hmm. far. Um, so the first one is where the Conservation Commission agent yep. is. So mm -hmm. we'll include yeah, that on the list. Yep. I don't see anything else. Yep. No. Yep. Just the uh, Asian. <coughs> All right. Move on. Yes. Yep.
It's always good with the help with the open space plan. It's good. Yeah, we just had that, so we won't yeah. for another few years. Doesn't look like anything else is too related to us. Move on. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wasn't that uh, floodplain bylaw being updated already? Yeah, yeah, that's still going to go forward. It's not done yet, but it's already being done. Yeah, it was good to have about stormwater management, right? There's two different ones. Yeah, most of this is for zoning and planning board, not so much for us. Mm -hmm. I think that might be the last page with any. Oh, we got a, yeah. So, culvert assessment waiting list. So, if we want to have all of our culverts assessed in Waitley, we could put ourselves on the waiting list for who knows, it might be 2024, but I could always put that on there too. Sure. All right. So four things is what I remember. There's the culvert assessment, pollinators, uh, pilot, and the shared agent. So is that, is yep. my memory working okay? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Sounds right. Pretty good. All right. Does anybody else have anything we should talk about tonight? I was down at Noose uh, today. I noticed that they have uh, started some work on that at, green. At where? At Noose, the New England wildflower. Oh. Um, they, they've done some work on that greenhouse project. Okay. Not not much. I couldn't really tell what was happening there, but they've cleared out whatever was in that old greenhouse and flattened the earth a little bit. Well, if you see anything that looks ugly or like it's not going the way it's supposed to, let me know. Okay. You haven't heard anything from the recreation department, Scott, have you, about doing the um, irrigation for Hurley? They were supposed to get back to us. Yeah, no, I, I, I wrote him and he said, well, you know, we're, we're still thinking about it. We'll let you know when we want to talk about it. And so I have a feeling that once it started raining again, they all decided we don't need yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I figured. Yeah. Well, Scott, I just want to say I appreciated all your questions on the um, on the project tonight because I would not have known what to ask. Yeah. Well, this luckily is a low low gradient stream, so it's not too problematic. But when we get to if there was something on, uh, you know, some of the other brooks in town, Roaring Brook or Jimmy Nolan Brook or something like that, it would be. Um, It'd be a lot more complicated trying to mm -hmm. permit one of these things. It's it gets very technical, and it, we would have been better shape if we could. Well, maybe we would still be able to bring Patty Divine into it as a consultant for the commission to help us uh, work our way through it. But this one, I I don't think it's going to be too big of a problem if they have a decent plan. It's just a matter of sort of matching the elevations with the stream that's there. Um, so. Uh, at least this one, I think we can handle without too much help. How many revisions is this now or plans? This has been going on for what, a year and a half, two years now? Yeah, I think 2021 is when we got the original notice of intent. So uh, if only we could check our spreadsheet. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a, it's really unfortunate that it got um, slowed down by the uh, by a variety of different things, but it, it, it could have gone in last summer when everything was dry. That would have been the ideal time to do it. Mm -hmm. But given that it's shown as a perennial stream, I guess we can't assume that it's going to go in dry in the future. And so, you know, I'm glad that they giving us the plans for dewatering and for you know how they're going to build this thing even if it's still uh got water in the stream yeah i, I was still not entirely clear on on um, why why the plan changed um the audio was breaking up so much from the uh, from the consultant it was it was hard to follow him Something I guess with the pipe, yeah, the piping. You want to go to Duct Island instead of plastic or something? They worry about the line. I should even worry about the line freezing or something. Or I wasn't understanding. Yeah, but if it's four and a half feet down. Uh, yeah. And then we don't have a DPW. Yeah. Um, we we have a water department. We have a highway department, and it wasn't clear to me who who stipulated what should be done there. Yeah, the DOT got involved somehow because it's state road. Yeah, Maybe. Todd said it was the water department. Okay. So the water department has decided they don't want plastic pipes anymore, or something like that. So uh, they can't they can't try to do the directional bore because they need a flexible pipe, and the water department wants it to be iron, I guess. I mean, I don't, you know, maybe they have a good reason for it. I don't really know. Um, but that was the reason why they said they couldn't do the directional bores. They needed mm -hmm. a flexible pipe rather than something that's that can't move around rocks and roots and things when they go to. Right, right. Mm -hmm. All right. I think it's probably time to pull the chain tonight and uh, call it a night for this month. And we'll pick up again next month on the 15th of February. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Good, Good night. night. Good night.